The story I'm about to tell you is one of the most extraordinary tales of our time. It's a story of change, a change which has affected all of us. Some say it's a change for the worse. Others find it a change that is very exciting. to you to judge for yourself whether you think the new sound of music gives you as much lift and as much pleasure as the tones which came out of this late Victorian barrel organ. But one thing is certain. When this machine, with its wooden roll and its metal pegs which tweak little levers to open and close the stops on the organ pipes and produce the right notes, first appeared on the streets, this was, to the many people who heard it, their first experience of recorded music. And once the engineers realized that they could capture the sound of music mechanically, it was inevitable that music was going to change. Instead of a hedgehog robot stabbing out the notes, with a new control system, much grander performances became possible. By triggering several instruments at once using perforated paper rolls, the fairground was suddenly offering robot music as a new attraction. It wasn't long before the new technology found its way into the home, which meant that, perhaps for the first time, the keen musician was no longer limited by his lack of talent. This time, the paper roll triggers the notes using a system of suction. But because the pianola depends for its quality and its tempo on how skillfully I pump with my feet and manipulate the controls with my hand, there's no way that I can be certain of getting exactly the same performance of the piece of music out of the instrument every time I play it. And indeed, the pianola was never intended to be that sort of instrument. But using largely this technology, it soon became possible on a more sophisticated piano to produce identical virtuoso performances every time a piece of music was played. The novelty was electricity, taking all the painful legwork out of pianola recitals and enabling inventors to create a host of quite extraordinary music makers. The strings are fingered by tiny pads pushed up by a battery of electromagnets. Another electromagnet generates the tremolo and an electric motor powers the wheels which bow the strings. And it was electrical contacts made through the perforated paper roll which drove the machine. The 
piano might still be popular today, but for the development of a machine which produced not an automatic performance, but a recording of an actual one. <laughs> the voice of Sir Harry Lauder, replayed on a phonograph. No paper roll or musical box could make a sound like this. The phonograph, and later the gramophone, could capture complete performances. But it was to take another breakthrough in recording equipment before those performances could be changed. This monster of the 1930s was one of the first magnetic recording machines. Today, it's the musician who gets isolated on the other side of the glass-fronted booth. But back in the early 30s, it was the forerunner of the magnetic tape recorder, which had to be safely stowed away. And when you see the material on which it made its recording, you'll understand why the engineer always handled it with leather gloves. Two giant reels like this whirled through the tape recorder at a frightening 60 inches a second. This stuff, a razor sharp band of steel. And when this band broke, as it had a habit of doing, Everybody had to be well clear of the sharp edge as it scythed viciously through the air. But the necessity of forever joining the steel band together became, in the hands of the creative musician, a virtue. When just before the Second World War, German engineers demonstrated that what you can do with steel, you can also do much more conveniently with plastic tape coated with a close relation to rust. With the new tape, and nothing more than a razor blade, new areas of musical creativity became possible. The arrival of tape recorders meant even the most basic sounds could be transformed. Experimenting with music was no longer the monopoly of the imaginative musician. Even the earliest of tape recorders could manage quite happily the faithful reproduction of three notes twanged on the piano. It was the possibilities for unfaithful reproduction which also caused excitement. On this length of tape are those same three notes. If I wind this piece of tape through the machine by hand, at a speed which isn't constant and in a direction which is forever changing, those three twangs become a collection of quite different sounds. In fact, if we re-recorded this performance on another machine, I might end up with a sonata for three notes and tape recorder. And I wouldn't be the first. But let's take this creativity a stage further. Let's find the start of the last note. There it is. I'll cut the tape there. Now I can take the end note, turn it the other way round, and put it back, ready to join up. So, what have we got now? Our first two notes are still the right way round, producing a boing sound with a quick start and a slow finish, or what musicians call sharp attack, gentle decay. But now we've turned the last note the wrong way round. We've got the decay first. Now it's become a sound. And if I finish the joins here, it should sound something like this. Crude stuff, you're probably thinking, but to some people, the possibilities of doctoring natural sound using the new magnetic tape became an obsession. In 1958, a reluctant BBC was forced to allow a tiny group of enthusiasts to get some gear out of redundant stores 
and establish itself here in two rooms in London's Maida Vale. The Doctor Who theme, just one of thousands of signature tunes, special effects and pieces of background music created by the Radiophonics Workshop since 1958.